I have Tascam D840 Digital Audio Tape Deck. This is a professional studio deck. And I know this unit does play, but it needs a belt. And I finally found a belt for it, which I didn't have to pay 30 bucks to order. I found it in another old piece of equipment. Playback works fine. There's no display on the view meters, and it does not record. Now, I don't have a manual for this thing, so this is going to be a challenge, as I'm going to have to do a bit of signal tracing and bit bashing, but I think we'll get this one going. I've uh, come across a small belt that might go on my second task M DA40. So let's uh, see whether this belt is going to fit it. If this belt is the right belt, then I can uh, work on getting this one working. It's a used belt. I don't know what shape it's in, but it looks to be that might be the right size. Now this belt came out of an old Sony DTX-10 car dat deck that they had drum seized up on. It's over 30 years old, but it still looks to be in pretty good shape, so I hope it works. So I'm going to uh, see whether it'll fit it. And if so, then I'll be able to uh, do some work on this thing. I guess I'll just take out these other screws. You can take out this main bracket and leave it on the leave it mounted on the bracket. I bought this deck a couple of years ago for 20 bucks. And um, well I knew the belt needed to be replaced on it. That was that was a given because they all wear out. These task cam belts were all wear out. But um, I knew the belt needed to be replaced, but I got the thing to load. And I found that it did play, but again, there was no display on it. And I just kind of set it aside because at that point in time, I didn't have a belt. And uh, I wasn't going to say I wasn't going to order one from Tascam. Because the belt was like 10 bucks, but they charged another 20 bucks to ship it to me. It was like $30 US by the time I got this stupid belt. And I was, I've never been able to find the exact one. Uh, but now I know the DTX-10 belt is the perfect size for if you can find one of those from Sony. But... Uh, uh, because it's, well, as you're going to find out when we get this thing open here, it's the exact belt. Nice thing about these Tascam units is they were very easy to work on. To change the belt, you just had to remove four screws and do one plug. And then take out the screws on the servo board lift the servo board out of the way and this is this is the little belt right here that I'm talking about that little loading belt and I just happened to say I just found a small belt in another unit that is uh, bad shape and this belt might be the right belt keep my fingers crossed that it is the right one as soon as I saw it I thought this belt might be the tiny little belt that goes on the, the DA40 and it looks like it looks like that's the right belt so let's put this board back in and I will see whether this thing loads a tape without slipping. So see this this belt is not new and I don't know what shape it's in. But if this thing will load a tape, then I can start working on some of the other problems because this unit does have the belt was bad for sure, but it does have another problem. Initially when I bought this unit, I actually bought it as a part spare because I have a DA40 that I use in my uh, production studio for playing back some DAT tapes that I've got and transferring tapes and stuff. So I initially bought this thing just to have as a spare and hadn't really intended to service the thing, but uh, now that I've got a belt for it, if I can get this thing working, I'll do it. In fact, if I get this thing working, I can turn around and sell this because... Uh, these units are worth quite a bit of money in working condition. There's a lot of ones out there that aren't working, but uh, and most of them just need the belt. 
but both the DA40s that I purchased, and I only paid like 20 bucks each for them, both of them had problems. One had a bad regulator and a belt, and this one had a bad belt, and other problems which we will see shortly. But both have very low hours. The other one had, I think, uh, I think it had 170 hours or 150 hours when I got it. This one has like 230 hours on the drum. So these things have got no hours on them whatsoever. The reason I'm putting the screws back in is because I don't believe the, the, the other problem that this unit has got is in the deck. So probably won't have to take the deck apart. Again. We grab a tape. All right. Ha <laughs> ha. That's the right belt. I like it. Will this thing play? Let's see if this thing will do anything. Okay. Hey, it's playing. What do you know? Okay, this thing's playing. What the problem with this is... I'm going to grab my royalty-free tape. I grabbed one that wasn't royalty-free. I'll stop this thing. i got to press stop first. I'll grab my royalty-free tape. One thing I should point out is these are not like working on old tube analog gear. They are very complex. You've got both analog and digital circuits. And yes, the analog circuits are easy to, to trace a signal through, but the digital ones, not so much because you might have a bit stream, but if it's the clock is off or something is not quite right, you'll get nothing through them. It won't decode anything. So here's the problem. So the unit is playing. The problem is I have no view meters. I have no display. So, uh, I haven't tried it for record, we'll do that. We'll try it for record and see if it will record anything, but I have no display here. I have nothing on the display. That's the problem with this one, besides the belt. It's not a bad score, I picked this up for 20 bucks. And will it display anything? I'm looking for the menu. I forget how to work this stupid thing. Uh, menu edit. How do I do this thing? Shift. See, it's not. It's not reading anything. I mean, that part works. Um, what if I hit by skip? Will it skip? So what I'm doing here is I'm gathering information as to what it is and what it is not doing. It's not reading the time code off the tape, for example, and it's, and it's not displaying anything on the VU meters. But it will play. Oh, so it's not reading. It's not reading my my. It's not reading my tracks. It's not reading my tape display, not reading my tape position either. So go to display, right? It's not displaying anything. Counter mode. That part works. But it's not reading my absolute time, my program time, my remaining time. That part's working. So we know the display, we know that that's working. But it's not reading off the tape and it's not reading my uh, level. But uh, we'll try this out and see whether it's going to uh, make a recording. Definitely plays back. So that's what I gotta do is we're gonna figure out, see if I can see if I can figure out why. I have no idea at this point, but it's obviously it's not getting data. The data's not being passed from the deck into, into the display circuit, but again, I'm not getting I'm not getting the VU meters, but that might be all part of reading the data stream. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check that out. But 
at least I'm making progress because now I've got, we know the deck works mechanically, there's no problem, it's playing the tape fine, so we just have to deal with this display problem. Incidentally, the belt I used to repair this one came out of my old Sony DTX-10 car dat player. I, I, show, I showed that one a while back. And that's the one that the drum had seized up on it, even though I got it kind of working, while well, the drum bearing is shot. It's a DIN car deck that plays dat tapes. Um, the, I wasn't going to get the right belt for it because the drum itself was seizing up and it, it seized up again. It just so happens that the loading belt for that is the same loading belt as the DA40 uses. So I pulled the loading belt off that one and I put it on this one. And that's got this one playing back. I have no record, I have no display, no VU meters, and of course there's no input. But something you should know about these units is you can put them in what's called a pass-through mode by just hitting the record button with no tape installed. And that will allow me to troubleshoot the circuitry without having the, a tape loaded and without having the drum spinning, running up hours on the drum without the tape actually moving. So I don't have a schematic for this thing. I know nothing about it. I've looked. I haven't been able to find one. But the fact that the, the two faults seem to be related because I, I have playback sound off the deck. So I know that the deck is working. But I'm not getting any sound on my VU meters and I'm also not getting any uh, tape counter movement or any, I should say, any time code from there displaying on the, on the vacuum fluorescent display. Um, when I put it in record, it shows t time code that it's trying to record, but it doesn't uh, play anything back and it doesn't record any sound, and there's no sound passing through. So I think that the two of them have to be related. It may be a power supply, maybe one of the voltages is missing. I think something along this line, they are related because I'm not getting any analog input and I'm not getting any display on the VU meters. Now, I can put this thing into the record standby mode without a tape in it, and that should pass my signal from the input through the output and I should have deflection on the VU meters, but it doesn't. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it into the what they call the E2E -E mode and that should pass through the signal and that way I can start to troubleshoot and see where I'm losing the signal. And again, I'm going into this blind because I don't have a service manual, so maybe we'll get lucky today, maybe we won't. But let's uh, see what I find. Okay, let's look and see if there's voltages from the power supply. There's two sets of leads that come up from the power supply. One, well actually there's three sets. One goes into the deck and the other one, there's two points on the board here where we have two separate power supplies. So let's check and see whether we're getting voltages on all these supplies and if they're the same. They look to be the same um, colors of wire so let's just check and see. We've got five volts on the red, zero, zero, and eight. Let's go check this one and see whether we have five zero zero and eight. Oh, fourteen there, okay. Zero, negative fourteen, and zero. So we got a positive fourteen. This would be for the op amps, and a negative fourteen. I don't know whether this thing uses a negative five in it as well or not. But let's just check the the voltages leaving the power supply here. 5, this is the 5 volt one, 0, 0, and, and 0, oh, and 8, sorry. And then this other one here, which had the red connector, has 14, 0, negative 14, and 0. And this other one that's going to the deck has 8, 0, 5, and 0. So those are probably correct. I haven't pulled the power supply to see, and if I needed to, I could pull my, I have another identical DA40 that works, so if I really needed to, for comparison, I could pull the other deck out of my studio and go through it, but I don't think that's necessary at this time. There's another regulator here. What is this one here? Just check the voltages on this regulator here and see what we've got. We've got 14 volts, and we've got five. That's a five volt regulator. 7805 that's correct once again I say these are probably some of the more complex uh, tape decks you're gonna find um, they were specialized I know when they were in service like Sony wouldn't even let the service centers work on them if you had a DAT deck uh, problem it had to go back to Sony 
to be worked on and they just changed boards on them a lot of times same with the digital camcorders uh, it was just something that you didn't service we no problem with the analog ones you could trace all those circuits no problem but the digital ones just added another level of complexity and i don't don't expect novices to be bit bashing like on these things like i'm doing right now it's a very complex uh, design and i do have sound going into this i have an input from my mp3 player so there is music playing into here which we should be hearing on the oh that's not plugged in all the way uh, maybe it is wouldn't that be something if it was just a plug that was loose I'm just doing my initial inspection to see if I can spot anything that uh, looks obvious. I say it would be nice if I could find a... I found a service manual, but <clears throat> the service manual is half in Japanese and it has every part, the full parts list, but no schematic. So what I'm doing here now is I'm just doing a visual inspection. I'm looking for anything obvious that may be a bad connection. Checking connectors, checking the flat pack ICs, looking for pins that aren't soldered down that, that are obviously bad. And then what I'm going to do, the next step will be I'm going to get the scope out and we'll start checking the audio path starting at the input and working our way through to see where we lose it. Now, once it gets to the digital uh, path, it's going to be a little more difficult because it's just going to be a bit stream. We're not going to know if it's right or wrong. We're just going to see data. So that's where it gets really complex is once you get into the digital because you won't see your audio uh, signal. You'll just see a stream of ones and zeros. I'm going to check the... Uh audio here this is this looks like to be where the the level controls are so the audio should come in here go to the level control and then come back this is the a to d converter it's marked here a to d so this is where our analog signals our audio is uh, audio is down here this is the a to d converter and i think the d to a converter is over here it should be marked yeah this is the d to a converter over here it's marked d to a so the, the, this is for the playback side this is the record side over here and then this is all the digital area of the board here where the digital signals are handled I think they, they pass from this board up to this one and then come back this, this board is your digital input and output and remote interface I think probably what happens on this is the audio is digitized and the the level meters are actually measuring the digitized um, audio they're measuring it at the digital level I would think and that would be interfaced here on one of these connectors that goes to the one of them goes up to the deck and one of them comes back to the front board so this one here goes to the front board so this is probably the interface for the uh, the VU meters and all the digital data that is displayed. It's more than likely on that connector there. I'm going to test the audio signal here. <clears throat> this is the audio signal. I'll show the scope here. And this is controlled by the level control. I'll show you the scope. So this is the audio input going into the control and here is the audio output as you can see I have control of it this is the right channel so we know that audio is making it to the control and back to the board let's see where it goes audio is making it through the op amp so we know it's it's passing through here and one of these is going to be the digitizing I think this is probably the A to D I'll have to look up that chip and see what it is that could very well be the A to D chip. Let's look that one up and see what it does. Yes, the AK5351, which is this one right here, 
It's a 20-bit 64 times over sampling two-channel analog to digital converter and so that's the chip that's going to convert the analog signal into a digital bitstream and hand it over to the digital circuitry. So either somewhere here or somewhere on the digital board there is a problem I, I, th I think. But uh, we'll see first of all whether we, I'm going to see if I can find the pinout and see if we've got a bitstream coming out of this thing. Should be able to check it on one of these uh, test points here. Should be a clock and there should be data. This is probably it here. Audio data. Right, I think this is probably our test points here. That we should be able to see a bitstream that's leaving the A to D converter. And that'll prove that the analog input's good and that our problem is somewhere in the digital circuitry. So it'd be nice if I had a schematic to kind of show me which way signals go, but that's the problem with electronic servicing is that uh, a lot of times you can't get manuals, especially for older equipment. Some things you could, others you can't. And everywhere I've looked online, I've, I found the service manual, but it, none of it's had the uh, actual schematic, just the parts list. It's almost like they want you to replace the whole board. I tell you, I have a cat that thinks it's a dog. He's sitting at the door howling because he wants to play fetch. He's got his little stuffy toy there and he wants me to throw his stuffed toy and he'll go and fetch it and bring it back to me and then drop it at my feet and start meowing again. I have two creatures sneaking in here to, to visit. That's not the one that wants to play fetch either. That's just another one. So let's look. take a look at that uh, A data. And we'll see that there is digital data there. If I put it on my digital scope, we could actually capture it. But this is the this is the data. If I turn the sound right off, right? If I turn the input right off, it'd be a little more, be a little more stable. If I give it some volume, you see that the data actually changes because we're seeing the live data stream. So that's that's uh, the input. So we know that the A to D converter on this unit is working. A cat is terrible. He sneaks in here. And finds a piece of oh, there's a piece of tape from my reel-to-reel -reel test tape that was just hanging off the reel, and he climbed up and chewed a piece off and was going to eat it. Piece of the leader. No music lost, but I lost a couple of inches of leader tape. Err. I can't leave my reel-to-reel uh, -reel in the house. I can't keep it laced with tape for display because the cat will jump up and will chew the tape and eat it. So I have to keep the reels off of it or keep the reels securely taped so that the cat can't get the tape off them. A psycho cat. Well, that was really interesting. I just put my finger in here and pressed on this chip and uh, my sound came on. I'm gonna move the camera here. That's interesting. I had the camera off for a second as I was poking around. And, uh, well, let me lower it down here. I still have no display on my uh, my chip. I put my finger in here and press on it. Okay. Interesting watch. Uh, where was I put my finger? I have a feeling I have a... My confidence level is getting higher. I have a feeling we have a bad connection on this chip right right there. I just, just happened to touch it right in the corner here. And the sound came on just with my finger. I'm going to heat up the iron. We're going to reflow this chip and see whether that fixes the problem on this. That would be great if it does because then I'll have two of these DA40s that are working. Now what got me thinking about in this area here is that I had signal coming in. But I had nothing... Like I had nothing going to the display or anything, and nothing, everything passes through this chip here. 
but nothing getting to the deck for record and nothing getting to the display. So as I say, I was just, I had the camera off just for a minute there as I was moving around. I just happened to put my finger, I just happened to touch right there. And then, bam, the sound came on. I was like, holy smoke. Like if I, if I turn it back on, I got it off right now. But if I turn it back on and hit the record button, you know, I just happened to touch, see, right there. And the sound came on, and that's exactly how I discovered it, was I just, just touched right there, and the sound came on. Let's see if we can get a close-up and see if we can even spot a connection before I get in there and solder it. Yeah, look at the crack right on the edge there. We're going to put some flux on here and I'm just going to retouch all these pins on this CXD 2607B chip by Sony. I was waiting for my iron to heat up. I've got the small uh, tip on, the, the fine tip, and we'll, uh, we'll touch this up here and uh, see if it makes it work. Now I'm no expert on DAT, DAT machines. Some, some of you guys might think I'm an expert on DAT machines and I get requests to fix them all the time and I'm not an expert on DAT machines. I'm far from an expert on DAT machines. I've worked on a few, namely the ones that I own and I've had a few come in to have alignments done on them but uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on DAT machines. Um, I get lucky sometimes but but Servicing these things is no different than servicing any other electronics. You have to, you have to kind of isolate where the problem might be, and you do that by what functions are working, what functions aren't working, and then try to isolate the location, the area of the board where the problem may be. And that's exactly what I did in this case. <clears throat> I knew it once I replaced the belt on the deck itself that the unit would play. So okay, the, the transport's good. There's nothing wrong with the servos. There's nothing wrong with the, the actual deck itself. There's nothing wrong with the D to A converter. And there's nothing wrong with the control circuitry that controls it. Where am I losing my signal? Well, I'm not getting my VU meter display, but I'm not getting anything on record. So we have to look at where does the signal go? Well, the signal starts in the uh, analog to digital circuit, which is over here, which is this area over, over here. So I, I, I measured the signal coming through the um, analog input level control, found that I had good signal there. It's passed on to the A to D converter. We measured the signal over here. We had a digital signal. Here's where the deck connects. So um, everything's going in this area here. So I thought it's, it's got to be something in here. And I just happened to start poking around. And as I say, when I, put, when I put my finger down here and touched this chip in the corner, pushed it down, bam, sound came on. Bam, VU meters work. There's where our problem looks to be. Get my flux out. I'm going to flex this chip up here. Get my big magnifiers on so I can see what the heck I'm doing because this is pretty small here. Get the uh, little screwdriver out. We'll throw some flux on that, that chip. Try to get my camera in good, start, strong focus here. My flex has, hasn't been opened in a while and the top of the, the uh, bottle has basically glued itself shut, but I got it open. Okay, let's get some, uh, let's get some flex on this chip. I don't know if I'll be able to leave the camera here while I'm doing this because um, I'm going to have to get my head right in there to see what I'm doing. It's not in the easiest position to see, but we'll see. 
I may have to move it up a bit. Okay, the chip is, I think, resoldered. I'm going to uh, clean this up with just some isopropyl first, just so I can uh, verify that there's no bridges. The flux won't hurt it, but I can't see whether I've got any bridges in there with that in there. So we're going to get in here and we're just going to clean this up so they can verify that there's no uh, solder bridges and then we'll test it. See if it works. If I put in the tape now and hit play, my display is working which it wasn't before. We may still have a bad connection on there. That part's working, so we're, we're getting there. Maybe one more connection. I'm just going to go double check and make sure, but I'm, I'm not getting any analog input, but my display is now working. Everything's displaying properly when I play a tape. So that part is working. When I hit the uh, analog in, I'm not getting my signal through yet. So I'm just going to go double check. I know I'm in the right area. I may have missed one. I'm going to get in there and take another look at it. So after just overlooking and just doing a few more here, I can now turn on the power and when I hit the record button, I have sound from my analog in and my display is working. Let's check this out. As you can see, my display is working now. Let's uh, load a tape that I can record on. I think this is a blank one. We'll just double check. I'm pretty sure this is a blank tape that I can record on. And it doesn't appear to be anything on that tape. That tape looks to be blank. So we'll just do a recording. I'll just rewind it back to the beginning. And we'll hit record pause, which puts us into the standby mode. It's going to format the beginning of the tape. Okay. Music's just starting, but it hasn't read it's not ready yet. But I'll cue this up here in a moment. It's, it puts a format on the very beginning of the tape. To ID it. Okay. Now it's ready to go. We can set our uh, record level. Probably it's good enough because it's not a very loud song, but so I want to start my recording. I hit the pause, I hit the play button, and that starts the machine going, and then I start my music. And we'll let this record and we'll play it back when I'm done. Now that this unit is fixed. I could turn around and sell this unit for several hundred dollars. It has 230 hours of use on it. I looked at the drum counter, you can't reset that. 230 hours is nothing. The drums on these are typically good for two to three thousand hours of use. 
So lots and lots and lots of life left on this machine. And I have two of them. It's great. 20 bucks. That's what I picked this one up for. One of the things that these units are very sought after by these were these are recording studio decks, right? That's what these were designed for. The Task MDA 40s found their way into many radio stations. Um, pr probably most of the radio stations in the country actually uh, had the DA 20 or DA 30s or DA 30 Mark IIs or DA 40s. Um, these were a studio deck, and the strength to these ones is. They don't have any of the serial copy management bullshit that the consumer decks have. So I could make a recording of a CD on one of these and take that tape and copy it onto another one, take that copy and copy it onto another one, and I could, using the digital output and digital inputs on them, I could make a 100 generation copy and it would be identical to the original one. Whereas consumer decks, you could make one copy and then you could not copy that copy. These decks, you have the choice whether you turn on or turn off the serial copy management, and you can you can make you can set it to allow one copy, you can set it to allow zero copies, or you can turn it off. So I could make if I was record if I was working in a recording studio, for example, if I was a musician and I was mixing down my master tape, and I want to make sure that nobody could make a digital copy of that tape, I could make it and turn on full recording inhibit, and that would prevent anybody from making a duplicate of that tape or I could set it to one time and then that would allow that tape to have one safety copy made but that safety copy couldn't have any additional recordings made from it or I could turn it off completely so the tapes that were made on decks like this that were sent to CD replicating plants they would typically have them set to one copy which would allow people to make one copy on a digital format onto a mini disc or onto a consumer dat machine um, they would be set to one. They could choose to set it to zero and then you could copy all you wanted on, on, a, on a digital machine. Well, the, the consumer machines, you couldn't because they would automatically insert the first generation off the CD. Or you could set it to copy zero and then they would, when they dumped the tape onto the CD master, you try to record that digitally and you would get an error message to tell you you can't do it. So you can set them up in any way you want. So let's check this out. Here's our playback. It is absolutely perfect. Another strength to these decks over here, as you can see, when you're recording an analog input, okay, you get your record speed. Well, when you set the record speed, this is something that most consumer units didn't have. Some of the later ones did, but you can set your sampling frequency to 48 kilohertz or 44.1 kilohertz. It's not gonna change now because I'm not in record mode. But if I hit the record button, all right, I can change it to 48 or 44 or go to long play mode, which was 32 kilohertz. Back to playing my tape. Now, I didn't run this up in the levels because digital, you don't need to, right? You don't need to run, you don't need to run it up to zero dB. This is a relatively quiet song, so I didn't crank this one up. On these units here, You've got cue and review, so if I if I turn the dial, this is an old tape, it's probably full of dropouts. But if I want to make another recording, say on here, at the end of that one, and if I go to counter mode, uh, where's my counter here? I go to uh, absolute time. There we go, absolute time. And I can change to actually get frames as well. So if I hit my display button, I can display frames as well as hours, minutes, and seconds. So if I go back, you'll see here's our frame counter. So if I pause it, I can go right down, pause it right down to the frame. Oh, what am I doing here? I'm gonna go back into record. So if I hit uh, my record button, I gotta stop it. I gotta go record and play. Now here, if I were to set my levels up, there we go. 
This is a louder track, so we'll... We don't want to go over, but we'll bring it this far. We're going to take this one up too close to zero. So I want to record this track. So I start it up. Something on the shelf is vibrating to that bass. <laughs> If I want to play back, uh, I think I hit skip. It'll go back to that one track. Go back to the start of that track. I think. <laughs> I may not have it set to do that. Or I didn't record a start ID. Yeah, I did. I should start to that track when I hit play. set my pre-roll up. Normally you would set your pre-roll to like a half a second or a second. No, I actually missed the beginning of the track when I started it up. That's what happened there. As you can hear. Anyway, there it is. It's, it's fixed. I'm happy. Let's get this thing together. Get it. I'll get it out of the shop here. It's been sitting out here since I bought this thing out here in the dampness, but uh, now that it's all fixed, I can get it out of the shop and take it in where it's nice and warm so it doesn't uh, deteriorate. But I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Just remember, even when you don't have service manuals and you don't have schematics available on things that may seem impossible to work on, and digital audio is certainly not simple to work on because you can't really look at a waveform in a digital. You can see you got a bit stream. It's uh, let's say this one was this one was serviced by just detective work, knowing which areas and and having the silk screen on the board that tells me this is the A to D and this is the D to A section and this is the digital section. That's the only reference I had as to where I was working. I was working completely blind. Uh, I used the cables here going to the level control as a as kind of a starting point and then work my way this way and I say it didn't take me long uh, the first thing I after after confirming that I had uh, my data here and I wish I hadn't shut the camera off but I shut the camera off just so I could move it out of the way so I could take a look at it and I just when I was looking at the board I just happened to put my finger on here and give the IC a press and bam my sound came on and I wish I had that captured on camera but I showed you immediately after before doing anything that uh, there's where the fault was. It didn't take me that long. I've been working on this unit here. Well, I started on it around 11 o'clock this morning, and it's now 12:30, uh, 12:37, and it's finished. But I had it, I had it going. You know, I spent about an hour on this thing, getting it going. I guess finding the problem. Anyway, that's it. I'm all done with this. Let's uh, let's eject this tape, so you guys can watch this mechanism unload. There we go.
this one's done this one's fixed we'll uh, catch you in the next one real soon bye for now